In this video, I'm going to show you how I prep my trails for smoke simulations in Houdini. This is part two of part three for setting up your own custom trails in Houdini. And in this video, we'll specifically look at what exactly a voxel is, why you may be getting volume stepping in your simulations, and how we can fix it for smooth smoke trail lines. Let's dive in. Okay, moving right along, we're going to drop down a new node and call it Effects Smoke Trails. We'll dive inside here and drop down an Object Merge, and we need to grab our Animated Missiles. So I'll go to our Animated Missiles node, grab the Out, and now we need to drop down, I'll just drop down a Null real quick, and then an Extract Centroids node. And what this node does is it grabs the centroid of each geometry based on its specified name attribute. But one thing to note here is that the node actually is running over the piece elements that are at the primitive level. And so when it does that, we can't necessarily get our velocity attribute that's at the point level unless we drop down what's called an attribute promote and we can then promote our velocity from the point to the primitive level which will then let us extract not only the centroid, but then transfer the velocity over. Now, I wanna go over a quick example that happens quite a bit in Houdini, especially when you're first getting started. When you're doing simulations, and especially fast moving simulations, it's really easy to have some issues with either smoke or particles or fluids that are really moving fast. So right now, let's just set up our initial missile trail simulation in a way that typically most beginners set it up. And then after that, I want to go over how we can correct it and do it a better way. So to get started, I'm going to drop down an attribute adjust float node. We're going to wire this in here and I'm going to call the attribute name density. So density basically is the attribute that Houdini recognizes that needs to go into a pyro simulation or a smoke simulation. So we set our initial value to one. So it's making sure that the density on each particle that we have here, and there's only four particles, is density. And then we can drop down a volume rasterize attributes node and rasterize that density attribute into a volume. So this volume, this little fog volume here, we're gonna be plugging this into a pyro simulation in order to simulate some smoke because that's the input that it takes. So just a quick way to explain what volumes are in Houdini. Imagine that we have a grid here that's actually just representing, each square is representing a pixel on a screen. So um, you probably are aware of screen resolution and pixels that represent just a color on a screen. And so a big screen will be made up of lots of pixels. So that's a 2D approach to things. But when we're working in 3D, volumes work with what's called voxels. It's just a volume pixel. And th there's a lot of videos explaining this over the internet, but I'm just doing this real quick. And so imagine we have this 2D pixel grid, but imagine if like each one of those pixels was represented as just a 3D cube. So here we have a volume set up here in Houdini. And imagine these boxes, these blue boxes, each of them represented a single voxel, meaning just a volume pixel. And if each one of these boxes could talk to its neighbor, then we would be able to make a three-dimensional shape move over time if we told it certain things. So in fluid simulations or smoke simulations, they are just... Um, little boxes talking to each other and sometimes depending on the resolution when we talk about a resolution of a simulation in Houdini it's just these boxes and the area in which they encompass in the 3d world could be at a really tiny size and so all those tiny little voxels talking to each other takes a while to compute and one other thing to note is that these voxels right here maybe one of them if I was to delete this selected here, maybe one of them could have an attribute that's called density or temperature or a uh, velocity. And these attributes are the ones that talk to the other ones and tell them, hey, if I have a lot of density moving in this direction, then you need to push that way. 
And so right now I'm going to go over how we can push those voxels into making something really cool. So in this rasterize node, I'm going to adjust the particle scale here because by default particles, if they don't have a P scale attribute on them, they come in at size one, which a unit size in Houdini is one meter. So that made it smaller. And then I changed my coverage scale to 10 just to multiply the amount of density coming in. We'll drop down a pyro solver here and I'm going to grab the voxel size. We just went over voxels and paste relative references there. That means when we adjust the voxel size on the simulation, it will then also adjust the voxel size in our source node, which is good because the input resolution of volumes should most of the time be the same resolution going into the sim. Not for every single attribute, but especially for density, it's recommended. Now over in our pyro solver here, let's go over to our sourcing tab let's take a look at what we're sourcing. So we've got density, temperature, burn. So right now we're just going to set temperature to none. Burn here we can just get rid of because with our simulation we're not dealing with fire right now. We're going to go back to our rasterize attributes and make sure that we're sourcing density and B, which would be velocity. Quick note, make sure that if you are sourcing V, it's coming in as a source volume B, but in DOPS, in this simulation, it actually recognizes velocity as VEL, not V. So sometimes you may get hung up on that. Okay, so let's just start our simulation. We see that it is simulating this volume, but we can't really see it. So if we hit D in our viewport and go to background and hit to dark, we can then see our smoke a little bit better. And here's what I wanted to illustrate. We see as this smoke density travels, um, first let's just adjust the velocity coming in here to zero and let's adjust our dissipation to 0.01. So we see that the density is just stepping through the air. And that is because at every frame it's sourcing because it's moving so fast I'm going to change my voxel size here to 0 0.05 just to illustrate it better. But because it's moving so fast, there's no particle or no volume to fill in the gaps from frame 1027 to frame 1028. So you get the stepping look because there's no subframe information. So one may go to their global substeps on their pyro solver on any simulation and say, hey, why don't we just crank that up to two because then in between it will simulate frame 1001.5. It'll simulate in between each frame and that does make it better. And you can bump it up even more to three sub steps. But every time you bump it up, you increase dramatically your simulation time. And so it is making it clearer, but it's still not giving us a definitive result. And then on top of that, what if these missiles were moving 10 times as fast? That would require 10 times as many substeps. So just cranking up substeps over and over is not going to get the result that you need for really fast simulations. And quick side note, hit D in your viewport and go to texture. And your 3D textures here, you can crank that up in order to get a more refined resolution on your voxels. You have to click on another tab and then click back. So now we see it's at a better resolution, but we really see detail that there's, there's just not enough information to make a good trail. So, so to solve this problem, let's go to our, our stream here and drop down a solver sop. So we're going to hook this in right after our extract centroid node. And if we play, nothing happens. So let's dive in. The way this node works is you have an input that comes in and then it records whatever previous frame happened. And right now nothing was happening because there was no previous frame. Nothing was happening. So if we drop down a merge, we hook it in, it'll then just record every previous frame and then drop down an output. And we're good to go as far as recording every single frame. And now let's jump back out. And we can play this and we see that every single particle is being recorded. That's what we want. And something that we can do is then drop down an add node. And if we go over to the polygons tab, 
click by group. Because we have a unique name attribute for each missile, we can source it by that attribute and say attribute name name. So then it generates a line for each missile. So we get this nice, smooth, refined line because of our original name attribute from the extract centroid node. Now coming back to animate missiles, one thing that we need to grab is the stopped attribute and it's not coming through in our transform by pieces. So we need to copy it over and there it is, stopped attributes to copy. And then in our delete, let's just, uh, in our unpacked, let's make sure that it's right there. Okay, so we have it in our data. Let's hop back over to the effects smoke trails. And then we also need to promote this to the primitive level because we were sourcing our missiles at the primitive level. And then we can finally pass it through our extract centroid node. Thank heavens. I'm going to drop down a blast node here and just let's just try to get rid of um, it, once the particle is stopped, we don't necessarily need it in our solver simulation. So we could say at stopped is greater than zero. So basically once it's stopped, then uh, blast it. We don't need it. So now we go through that. We have our unique trails that are sourced by name. And let's drop down an attribute create. And I'm going to put this before the sim and I'm going to call the attribute my frame. I'm going to set the value to dollar sign FF, which essentially is just going to record the frame number here in our geometry spreadsheet, the frame number. Um, every, every frame it's going to change, but when it goes into the simulation, it's going to freeze frame it or, or essentially stop it at that moment in time and record the frame at which it was sourced. So now we can click on my frame here by middle mouse clicking. We click on my frame and then we can see this visualizer here and it's progressing throughout the trail. So this trail has um, the ability to be resampled. So if we drop down a resample, we can add a lot more points to the trail to make it continuous. And those attributes that we have on the trail, on the line, are copied over. They're interpolated. And so now we can call by the frame number. We could say if F, which stands for flow at my frame, is less than at frame, which is Houdini's global variable for the frame number in the play bar, or if f at my frame plus 1.0, which in this case we're trying to delineate an offset in the curve, if that offsetted by one frame is greater than at my frame, we can then just remove any other points. So remove point, we get the first input and then we want to delete it by a point number. Nothing's working here. So maybe I did my offset wrong. Let me come in here and adjust this. Um, okay, so let me think just a sec. All right, so if we adjust this to two, no, still nothing. Maybe I have this set up wrong. So I think if we did it here in the less than frame, if we did the offset here, so if we did plus 0 0.01 and put this in parentheses, then that way, yeah, we're going to be sourcing that gap, that moment in time of our trail. So now as the missile goes, that's the amount of density that would need to be sourced as it's traveling throughout time. So we can change that offset value up to two or to one. I'm just doing it 1.0 right now to completely cover the gap, but maybe you want a little bit more just to cover a little bit extra if you needed to. But yeah, that's, that's the gap that now we can officially fill in with volume when we source. So now all of these points are getting assigned density right here. And if we drop down another add node and we actually, we could say remove line, we could just check delete geometry, but keep the points. We can see those are particles and now they're all sourcing that amount of volume. 
So let's go over to our particle scale and maybe drop that down to 0.05 so we don't get so much volume overtaking our missiles. We come back over here and let's just play the simulation and see the difference it makes. Uh, oh, sorry, didn't click the visualizer here in the simulation, so we hit play. Now we see this constant, smooth, crisp, straight line of density. And that's exactly what we wanted. And we didn't even have to adjust our sub steps. So if we go over to our fields here, maybe we change the dissipation back to 0.1, just so it fades out more. But now we've formed the basis of what we want for our missile trails. So no matter how fast they move, we would be able to fill in those gaps. And that's essential for making good missile trails. And if we go back and just check, look, before we did this, we have all this gap that's just not filled in. So I hope that helps illustrate the point of why trailing this in this manner is the key to making your simulation faster and just take less time to do. My next video will be part three of three of how you can initially set up procedural smoke trails. So next time we're gonna cover a lot more VEX and different things we can do to tweak our simulation in order to get really cool procedural trails. And if you're interested in the full course, go over to parameter three and you can catch it all there.